left, let me see a few faces who've been away for a while. There are some people who were greeting each other with Happy New Year. <laughs> because I think it goes like that, right? Uh, because we don't meet every week and people have other things that come up. Sometimes, yeah, so we are at the end of February and some people haven't greeted each other since Christmas. But welcome. It's also half term for some schools. And it seems that a number of people have also taken this weekend to get away. So I think you were watching the group and there are a number of people who've gone away. The Marriott's are celebrating an anniversary and Sean and Rodney are celebrating a big birthday. Um, yeah, and there are a couple of people who are not well. Nigel is at home recovering. So there's a few people who are not here and missing. Uh, but I always think when there's a smaller group that God has something special. Um, that tends to be the way it works, which is interesting. So I am anticipating something interesting this morning. So let's see what happens. Shall we light a candle as we always do? And I say it every time, and it is never meant to be repetitive, but in a sense it is meant to be repetitive. Because the sentiment is always the same. And that is that the light of the candle is to remind us that this is a sacred space and that we welcome the Spirit of God into this place. So as I light the candle now, just take three or four seconds on your own, maybe to close your eyes and just to take a prayer between you and God. Maybe say thank you that you are found in this place Maybe acknowledge God in your own way, and then we will pray together. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 25, verses 1 to 10. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Saviour. And my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me. For you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right, and he teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful towards those who keep the demands of his covenant. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning. We come to you with all of our stuff. We come to you with our joys. We come to you with our heaviness. We come to you with our achievements and the things that we reflect on in the week that we are delighted about and grateful for. And we also come to you this morning with the sadnesses and the heaviness of what this past week has held. Thank you that we can come to this place and lay it all before you. Thank you that you are an ever-loving, ever-embracing God, full of mercy and full of kindness. Thank you that we can gather in this way. Thank you that we can be together to encourage each other, to fellowship together to learn together, to love together. We love you, Lord God. 
We are so grateful for your righteousness, your justice, and who you are in our lives. We ask now that you would make yourself known, that you would be amongst us, that we would sense your presence, and that this time would bring glory to your name and your name alone. And we ask all of these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Just listen to that again. 29,000 fatalities in Gaza. 69,000 injuries. And 1.7 million people have been displaced in Gaza. Okay, that's almost incomprehensible, right? It's like, I don't even know what to say to that. So I thought we could just take a minute and uh, let's just have a moment together of silence. And if anybody would like to pray, please out loud after a prayer and then I will pray as well. Is everybody okay with that? Let's take a moment. Ever God, we also want to uplift millions who haven't had education for six months, who don't even have schools to go to, or books, or resources, or libraries. So to be conscious of of being able to eat wholesome meals, but also not even able to educate <clears throat> in the last time to that. We just pray that you continue to soften the hearts. Your city as a surrenders act against the people in the Middle East. Lord, when we, <coughs> we think of these many, many people who have lost loved ones, probably more than one family member. We then think of those who have lost limbs, who are needing medical care. We think of those who are struggling with disease, and unsanitary conditions. We think of those who are hungry. We think of those who are orphaned. We think of those who are hungry. We think of those who are without homes, without clothes. Lord God, the situation is simply desperate. And we cry out to you. We cry out to you for your mercy that you would hear our cries. We sit here in some ways paralyzed by the overwhelm of what is the situation in Gaza. Please, Lord God, intervene in a supernatural way. And may we become more conscientized to be better activists and better able to contribute to the solution. Oh Lord God, we pray that you would hear our cries this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. 
Sadat today be worth uh, following mm -hmm. along. Before Sadat comes to read, though, I want to just give you a little bit of context to, to the sermon. So we're in the ser series of the Christian calendar that's called Lent, uh, which is leading up towards the crucifixion. So we follow the story of Jesus as he, as he moves from the time of ministry, the three years that he had had, where he had been traveling around uh, Israel, and now he goes to Jerusalem. And he actually wasn't well known in Jerusalem. He hadn't gone to, it was the capital city, but he hadn't spent his time there. He had spent most of his time up in the north in a small area around Galilee, had gone to the real top of the country at a place called Caesarea Philippi, and he had sort of skirted around, but now he's coming to the capital. And it wasn't just the political capital, it was the spiritual capital uh, as well, very much as modern Israel is too. And in the spiritual capital, mm -hmm. there, there were a number of different religious orders. There were the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes and a uh, number of, of others, the Zealots, uh, and then there was this group called uh, the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders. They don't really have a, another name, but it was essentially the high priest, and there were seven families uh, whose sons and eldest sons and sons of sons all sort of managed the show. This was now the heart of the, the Jewish established religion. And Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and he's only there for a week before these guys reckon, no, we've, we've got to get rid of him. Um, and, but Jesus did everything that he could to make sure that he was not uh, to them, and I don't mean in a good way. Uh, he came in, and this is not your gentle Jesus, meek and mild, that you're going to hear about today. This is that fiery Jesus. Other Gospels put the stories in different places in order to make a point about Jesus. But we're pretty sure that all of that stuff about turning the tables over and all of his engagement in a fiery way with the leaders all happened in one week, the week leading up to, to Easter. And uh, Matthew in as short a time as he's got in his book and the choices he has to make, he dedicates three and a half chapters to this confrontation with the, with the church leaders. And what Jesus says, if, if, if you've got Matthew 23 open in front of you, he says here, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. What that means is that there were a number of seats in, in the temple Moses' seat was reserved for the person who would be reading the scriptures at the service. So we, Jane allocates different things, Jane outsources, as we heard last time, uh, to different people. So we've got Save sitting in Moses' seat today because she's going to come and read. There we go. So she's going to come and read the scriptures to us. And what Jesus is saying is these religious leaders, he actually says to them, he says, you must be careful to do what they tell you. And so in other words, he's saying the word of God, when it's just read, when you, when you hear the word of God, that is absolutely vital to your spiritual growth and development. But, he says, do not do what they do, for they do not practice what now he's saying this to his disciples, but in front of all these guys, loud voice. Um, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for other people to see. And as, sorry, you can start coming up now. Um, as, you, as we read, he then goes in and he turns from his disciples now. So picture the scene. He's walked into the main temple. He's got his disciples with him. He's sort of talking to his disciples. He's making a scene. He's making a noise. And now he turns and he speaks to the religious leaders. And you're going to hear a word 
well, I'm not sure which translation Sally's going to use, but the word most often used in English translations is hypocrite. It comes from the Greek word uh, hypocrites, which you can see why they would say hypocrite. But what, when you think of hypocrite, what, what do you think of? What's a hypocrite? Fake. 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 Okay, that's a, a, a nice translation. You'll see in a second. Sort of somebody who says one thing does another. That's not what Jesus means. Hypocrites is an actor, which is why fake, I think, is a nice mm. definition. That's what Jesus wanted them to have in their minds. Not somebody who says one thing and then does something else, but somebody who is acting. Somebody who's playing a part. Somebody who isn't what they say. Their, their words are, are borrowed from somebody else, learned from somewhere. They're playing a game. And they're playing a role, but it's not actually who they really are. So with that, Jesus now turns. You've got the picture in your head. His disciples, probably like a little bit, um, are, are standing behind him. And Jesus now turns and he says this to the leaders. Matthew twenty-three. So it's actually from Matthew twenty-three, right into. 28 from the New Living Translation. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves, and you don't let others enter either. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross, bend, and see to make one convert. And then you turn that person into twice the child of hell. You yourselves are blind guides. What sorrow awaits you? For you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple, but that it is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. Blind fools. Which is more important, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you say that to swear by the altar is not binding. But to swear that the gifts on the altar is binding, how blind. For which is more important, the gift on the altar or the altar that makes the gift sacred? When you swear by the altar, you are swearing by it and by everything on it. And when you swear by the temple, you are swearing by it and by God who lives in it. And when you swear by heaven, you are swearing by the throne of God and by God who sits on the throne. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your health gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guide, restrain your water so you won't so you won't walk accidentally, so you won't accidentally swallow a net, but you swallow a camel. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you are careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then outside you become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you are like a white shed, tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. This is the word of God. Mm. Pretty hectic stuff, eh? Yeah, it's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, when a Jewish rabbi uh, teaches and, and one day we need to allocate about five hours to church Jane, so that we can understand this stuff properly. But a, when a Jewish teacher preaches a rabbi, and that's who Jesus was, well, he always was that, but in that moment, he was summoning every bit of being a rabbi, a Jewish teacher. They teach it at five levels in every one of their teachings, and I think Jesus did this every time he spoke. So it, it's, it's really remarkable. The, First thing you look for, and, and for us it's that extra layer, what, what was he saying to the people in that day? And that's where you have to start. 
So who was listening to him? What did they hear? And, and, I'll, and I'm going to come back to that because the first and the fifth link together to it. The second thing is, is called the Pashat reading. And that's where you look for what is the surface level implication. And so without knowing the detail, without getting into the underlying Greek translation and everything else and getting into the detail of it, just what does this sound like? You know, what, what's the surface most immediate level understanding? For most of us, that's what we do most of the time when you read the Bible, and that's most of the sermons you've ever heard. There's always value at that push-up level, because the stories that are told are very clever, and they, there's great meaning to them. So I want to start with that. And the push level of, of this sermon of Jesus, this woe to you, you leaders, and, and I want to bring it, the Peshat is to bring it into our context, make it relevant to us. Woe to you, leaders of the church. Leaders of the church who, who are hypocrites. You are acting out your faith. You want to just look good in front of everybody. You want to have all the right words. But where's your heart? And this has been a really tough sermon to to prepare i've been thinking about it for a long time and and then when jane asked me to preach and i realized we'd be in the lent uh, environment i thought well then this is that opportunity and it's a tough sermon because there's a danger in where we are because we are like jesus's disciples i wonder how his disciples felt as he turned around and just laid into these leaders. They'd never seen Jesus in this mood before. For them, Jesus was the, the healing Jesus, the, the 12 steps Jesus. You know, the every step forward is celebrated and every step back is just greeted with understanding and grace. That's the Jesus they have known. But now they're standing here watching this fire breathing. I mean, if you go a step further, we'll get to it in a moment. He, he says, you snakes, you brood of vipers, who is going to rescue you from the fires of hell? I mean, he's never talked like this before. But there was obviously this, this passion in Jesus. And the disciples must have recognized that the third level of Pharisee reading is to always invite his disciples to join into the reading. To say, make this your own. This now is a model for you to follow. So the difficulty of this sermon is I'm going to invite you to tell me what you think Jesus would be saying to the church today. And I know that for some of you, you don't have to dig too deeply to discover a brood of vipers in the church. You've been bitten by those vipers. That's right. You've, you've seen the hypocrisy. That's why you are at this church today, not at the church you grew up in. And I want you to trust me on this journey. I don't want it to become self-indulgent because the fourth level of the teaching is always the zinger. It's where the teaching gets turned around on you. So you know that's coming. You know that Jesus first invites you to join in the teaching, but then invites you to apply the teaching back to yourself. But I just wonder, for some of us, if it might be helpful, valuable, useful, to just reflect on the fact that we are disappointed with the churches we grew up in. Most people who join that we are church are here because you no longer feel at home in the church you grew up in, but you do not want to abandon Jesus. And you're trying to find a place where you believe Jesus is because you don't believe he's in the church you left. So what do you think Jesus would say about your church?
this side of it. Uh, for the life of you can record again. The zinger that comes in, in every rabbinic teaching, is where the story then, and I think Jesus might have turned at some stage back to his disciples. The story invites you to recognize that you are part of the story. And that you must find yourself somewhere in the story. And some of us need to look back and recognize we were part of that story at some stage. That's the I am an alcoholic part of the, of the story. Because we, whether by doing nothing or more actively by being involved in leadership in those spaces before uh, you know, the crystal conscientization of us. You know, we were involved. I was involved. Jane and I left a church uh, that had actually changed their constitution to allow women to become elders, not pastors, but just elders. And we felt that that was wrong. So we left that church. This was a long time ago. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> um, but you know, that was part of our journey in recognizing things. And then, you know, be because I'm theologically trained and my brain is programmed that way, you know, I was involved in the debates, the debates uh, in, in the verses that I read, where, you know, they're straining out the water so that you don't swallow a little mosquito. But then you don't realize you've literally eaten a whole camel. Um, and that's what Jesus says. That's, those were the words. Um, and we're straining out there and we're going down to trying to understand the meaning of what uh, it means to be the head in, in, in Greek. And is it the head as in the head of the body that if you cut the head off the body is dead? Or is it the head of the river? that the river flows because it has a head. And now we must discuss this. I mean, I'm into conferences on this stuff, you know? And, and people debate this, whereas that's the mosquito that we're trying to get out of the water so we don't swallow the wrong version of the Greek translation of the original Aramaic that Jesus actually spoke. And, and then you realize, no, but if you step back mm. and you realize that God is a God of love who created everybody, who's... The Bible, from cover to cover, talks about the equality of the, the God image that is in every single person yeah. in the world. Why would we not open our churches up so that we could hear from every single person to hear what the God image in them has to say to the God image in us yeah. on every single day? You know, just it's actually you, when you, Trisha, as you said, when you sort of wake up from that, that's this is actually so easy. Why did I feel that it was so hard? But it's because you were in that trying to sift out the mosquito st stage of your life. And whatever we might need to do to say we were part of that too, uh, and until Jesus came and said, no, there, there's a different way. Does anyone want to say anything about that part of what's happening here. I wonder what the disciples were feeling as Jesus was hurling these woes. So the, fifth, uh, the fourth level you get to is called the remes. And this is the bit where Jane would need to give me another three hours. Um, <laughs> but what the remez is, is every really good Jewish rabbi, and Jesus was possibly the greatest, um, would hide something in the teaching so that the most diligent of the disciples would say, there's going to be a treasure hunt here, and I'm excited to see where it is. And that is a link back to the Old Testament texts. There would always be an echo back to the texts. And the way you find it as you do your Bible study today is you look for what's the weird thing here? It's like what just doesn't quite make sense in the passage? 
And that's normally the hint for you that there's a reference back to an Old Testament story or a reference back to some very famous part of the Old Testament. And so a really great disciple would, would say, whoa, I've got at least a week's work here because I'm going to have to take that thing that the rabbi said I'm going to have to go and look for. What's the extra layer for me? It's this hidden piece. And that's why when Jesus says at some stage, his disciples say, why do you always sound like so confusing? You know, why do you always speak in parables? And Jesus says, well, and it was a weird answer. And Jesus says, well, it's because I don't want people to understand what I'm saying. That's actually not what he said. That's what you normally hear. Because that's what the word said. Because I don't want everybody to understand. What Jesus is saying is, I only want the people who are prepared to do the work to be able to fully get the deep depths of this message. If you understand this message at its depths, it's not for everybody. Because if you're not prepared to do the work, to get to the depth of this message, you probably wouldn't accept it anyway. It's an interesting thought, right? So that's called the remes. And the remes here is actually, this one's an easy one. Uh, well, I suppose I could do it. Does anybody know where there's a list of woes in the Old Testament? Yeah, uh, me neither, don't worry. Okay, I don't know either. And I did think. Okay, the, Jesus is giving this list of woes. Is there another list of woes? And I say this one is easy because there's only one other list of woes that's very similar. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 5. Um, and you'll see it's remarkable, uh, actually, uh, the link here. Often when you do this thing, you might discover, oh, there's 17 different lists of woes. Which one is Jesus actually referencing? This time it's super easy. And Jesus, in fact, confirms to us that this is what he wanted us to have a look at. So it starts in Isaiah chapter 5, and it talks about there's a vineyard. And the, the owner of the vineyard goes out, and he's got this big vineyard, but it's not producing great fruit. So he goes out and he, he digs the whole thing up. He just says, this thing isn't working. So he digs the whole vineyard up, and he fertilizes the soil, and he carefully removes all the rocks and he makes it just perfect for, for planting. And he then plants a new vineyard. And now he's excited because he's done all the hard work to get this vineyard going. And he comes back at the next season to do the harvesting and the vineyard is still empty. And then just because Isaiah doesn't want any excuses, he says in about verse 5 or 6 of chapter 5, he says, Israel is the vineyard. God is is the owner and Israel has been found wanting there is no fruit in Israel what do you think the owner is going to do and then just because Isaiah and Isaiah is one of my favorite prophets because he's just like on the nose he doesn't like Bach and he says the reason that you have no fruit is that you have no justice there is no justice in this land and then he goes into, woe to you who buy house after house and join your properties together so that there is no place for people to find place to rest. You put your houses and your land together until you are alone in the land. I mean, when was this written? 2023. Uh, what an amazing image of these people who just buy additional properties, they gate their communities up. Uh, you know, we had these conversations. Make sure the homeless people can't get into our property. Uh, you know, every Tuesday when the garbage pickers come down, there's all sorts of chat on the WhatsApp group. Yeah, you want to keep all the poor people out of here until you are alone in the land. Woe to you. Woe to you. He goes on in verse about nine. I don't know what the verses are now, but he goes on the next verse. Woe to you who are experts in drinking wine. You get up early. Now, this one I had to like, pause. <laughs> I'm pretty much an expert in drinking wine. But, but I, I think I'm, I'm safe on this. I don't know. I have to pray more about this. Oh, come on. But, but he says, you get up early in the morning and you start drinking wine already. And, and, it's, it's, and, and, and you just get you know, intoxicated and overcome with how much wine you drink. And you don't share it with others. 
I think that's the real issue. I'm not sure whether you want to take that as my, my um, interpretation of this. Because you take it, yeah, you take it differently, okay. Um, and he goes on and he's got six woes, all of which are justice issues. So now, back in Matthew, Jesus is giving this fire and brimstone, you leaders of the church, of everything you're doing wrong in the church. And that's a good enough sermon. You can stop the sermon. It's a great sermon. The church has hurt people and it needs to stop. But then Jesus has got this real mess, which he says, for those of you who want to take my message further, and I hope you all do as my disciples. This is the bit where the disciples get interested. He says, you can link this back to an older teaching. And you can understand that what I'm really critiquing here, although, yes, the church has messed around with its people. Thank you for those of you who have shared, and I'm sure there are many others in your heart. You know why you've left your churches. And you've got hurt, and a lot of the stories are very similar. They hurt us. But you see what Jesus is inviting us to do? He's inviting us to say, Zenobia, Henry, Trish, everybody else, do you think you were hurt? Jane moved us in that direction. But look at look at how much hurt the church has caused the world. Because what Isaiah said about, remember in Isaiah 5 verse 5, it says, Israel is the vineyard. Isaiah didn't, didn't leave this open for discussion and negotiation. And Jesus said the same thing is happening today in the church. The church has no fruit because the fruit is supposed to be a changed society. And you, church, are so invested in your... Jesus was pointing to the temple and the synagogue and all of the things around it. But then there was something smarter even than that. Because I can guarantee you that as soon as Jesus started with a woe to you, Isaiah 5 was in the minds of the, of the Pharisees. And in Isaiah there are six woes. What, what's the biblical, um, what does six mean in the Bible? Yeah, is that it? It's imperfect, yes. Six is the number of imperfection. Um, and it, it, it's a picture of just brokenness and imperfection in the world. So that's why there's six woes as well. It's almost like the number itself is like the final kicker in Isaiah. But if you count the woes in Matthew, there are seven. And I promise you, the religious leaders were counting Jesus as woes. And they got to number six, and then he gave them a seventh. And they were going, ooh. <laughs> this is now the, the number seven is the number of perfection. perfection. Okay, on the seventh, that's why on the seventh day God rested. It's, uh, these numbers are important in not not for any like magic power, but just for significance. It's part of the way of teaching. And listen to his seventh. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets. See what he's done here? He's like, yeah, yeah, I know you're thinking about Isaiah. I know you know your Bible. I know you knew this was the Ramez. Welcome to my TED talk. Um, <laughs> you say, if we had lived in those days of our ancestors, we wouldn't have ignored Isaiah. We wouldn't have killed the prophets. That's what you say to yourselves. But go ahead now and complete what your ancestors started. Jesus is not messing around. He's saying, you have perfected being bad spiritual leaders. You snakes. You brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? And now, my we are church friends final piece of a puzzle is called the sword. The sword is something only God can reveal to you. 
It's something that the preacher has to recognize. I'm done. The remez, that was pretty smart. I hope you appreciate it. But now it's up to the spirit. We must guide you to decide what you want to do. So I'm just going to read. And then we're going into a time of worship as response. Therefore, I am sending prophets, sages, and teachers. I think it was at this point that Jesus turned back to his disciples. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues. And you will pursue them from time to time. And so upon you will come all of this righteous blood. And then he, just to lay it in verse 36, he says, truly I tell you, this will happen in this generation. And I think he's talking to his disciples. I think he's saying to them, this is going to happen to you. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a chick as a hen gathers her chicks under her, her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I think God has allowed all of us to find each other here so that we can share our stories and we can find healing. I think God invites us then to look into ourselves and to discover again the prophetic voice. To say, we see what this world could be. We see what the church could be in the world. But I also think, and here's the zinger, that God is not going to be happy if this place becomes your sanctuary. The church is not a sanctuary. You can come for healing, but healing happens. And then you need to go back to that church and speak to them and tell them what you found and let them know. I think I might be dipping into a few of the 12 steps here. Yeah. Because you don't do it alone. You don't do it for yourself. Mm. It's never done. Am I right? This is the word of the Lord. Be careful what you say thanks for. I think God is calling us to be healed. Be healed first. But then he's calling us to go and take whatever, whatever, come, whatever gets thrown at us because we take these words back to the place we came from. We want to sing today in response to what we've heard and we're going to be in different places with what we hear. Some of us still need healing, some of us still want to feel safe and that's fine. Some of us want to see things differently. Some of us maybe need to begin to feel the urge to speak again and to say these words to families, to friends. To communities we have left behind. We need to hear from us again. Wherever you are, I hope you can find where you need to be in the salt today. Let the Spirit speak to you. Is there anybody who has a song that you would just love to sing? We have access to the entire YouTube back catalog of worship songs, and we can quickly get the words and throw them onto your WhatsApp. Is there a song that might just be in your head or your heart that would just feel appropriate at this stage? And I'm possibly looking at the musicians a little bit more intently who's thinking music. The goodness of God. The goodness of God. The goodness of Yeah? The goodness of God. All my days will be the goodness of God. CC as it is CDC. All 
or a verse to read or something to say. And this is a worship response now to what we've heard from God. For those of you who are new, if you just want to stand next to somebody from the church group, we've got a WhatsApp group together, and the words will drop into that, and then we just take it as it comes. And Trish, I'm not going to... Um, I'm not going to be the white guy singing into the microphone. So if anybody wants to sing into the microphone, then more than welcome, there is a microphone, but we'll just play the music and sing it For your mercy never fails me. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. Chapter 5 comes chapter 6, and that's often where people go to. Because chapter 6 is Isaiah's commission. You probably heard this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it was seraphim, each with six wings, angels flying all around him, crying, calling to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. He had seen the Lord. And what did he say? Isaiah said, oh no, woe is me. I'm ruined, for I am a person of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. 
Then one of those angels flew to me with a live coal in his hand. He touched my mouth and he said, See this. I've touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Who shall I say? Who will go for us? I say, finish our service by singing another song called I am who he says Thank you that we are your children, that you love us dearly, that you have called us to be your own. We thank you that you have shown us a way to love you and a way that we are loved that many of us didn't know before. We thank you. We thank you that we are finding healing and growth and insight and understanding like we've never had before. We pray that you would continue that work in us. Lord, we pray for our families, we pray for our friends, we pray for our churches, that they would see this too, that they would come to recognize your great love, that they would come to recognize your wonderful, wonderful grace. Lord, we pray that you would help us not to hide here in your grace that we would see that you have called us to take your grace back into that world and to show them who you really are. Let's say the grace together. Now, 
and love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, love, sorry, I missed it. <laughs> I was in my field, let's say, now may the love of God. <laughs> and now may the grace of God and the love of God. You lead us in whatever grace you want to say. Now. This is my part. <laughs> We're in a different place. Now may the grace of God and the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you.